Okay, guys, so as I mentioned today, we are going to be talking about serial killers and uh, forensic psychology. Okay, so a couple things to discuss here before we go ahead and uh, kind of transition forward is what are some of the key differences uh, between forensic psychology and forensic psychiatry? Now, to be honest, we're going to be focusing mostly on forensic psychology, but it is good to know about forensic psychiatry as well. So basically, forensic psychology and forensic psychiatry, they're trying to explain the behaviors of someone. And they would go through that by looking at two different routes, essentially. So psychiatrists are going to look at the physical brain chemistry. So what is physically happening inside of someone's brain that might be causing them to act a certain way. So they're looking at the medical side, looking at the physical characteristics of the brain. A psychologist is not going to be a uh, medical doctor. That's going to be uh, someone who is looking at the behaviors of one of these individuals. So basically uh, trying to look at the motivations and drives for why someone is behaving in a certain way. So basically these two ideas come together to give us a more holistic understanding of why someone behaves in the way that they do. And now, basically, these two different aspects can sometimes be at odds with each other when in the courtroom. So, but their overarching goal is to determine levels of insanity. So whether or not someone is insane and they're capable of standing trial. So some of the, the key things that a forensic psychologist does is the assessment of someone's mental state. So basically, uh, sorry, let me move this over a little bit here. So basically, is that person insane? Are they capable of standing trial? Are they going to be able to receive a fair sentence? And also looking at specifically a forensic psychiatrist or psych psychologist, sorry, um, they're going to determine what recommendations are for a specific sentence. So what type of a judgment should that person receive based on their mental faculties and their uh, physical uh, brain chemistry. Okay. So they're also going to determine what is the likelihood of that person reoffending or committing that crime again in the future. And that's a big part of determining a sentence as well. Now, although we didn't talk about this too much uh, earlier this semester, uh, we, a forensic psychologist would serve as what we call an expert witness. So this is a professional who basically goes up in front of the jury and the judge and gives their determination of that person's mental capabilities. So that's going to serve as an expert witness. And oftentimes, if, uh, if some of these suspects are going to have children, they're going to determine uh, child custody. So determining whether or not an individual will be a fair and, and just parent. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So as I mentioned before, this unit, we're going to be talking about some pretty graphic things. We're going to be talking about gruesome murders. So if at any point you feel like you're uncomfortable, please, please, please just let me know and we can give you some alternative materials that won't be related to uh, serial killers and their gruesome nature. So just feel free to reach out. Okay, so as we start to learn about serial killers, there's a couple key common misconceptions that we need to kind of separate. So there are three different types of murderers that we are going to talk about today, three different broad categories. So they are mass murderers, spree murderers, and then serial killers. So let's start to break down what the differences are between each of these. So a mass murderer is someone who's going to kill four or more per, four or more people in one place at one time. So their, their murders are not going to be spread out over a long period of time. They're going to take place in one event, and it's going to be very quick. Okay. So they're also going to have a clear motivation. We're going to know why they're trying to do uh, these killings, why they're trying to kill these people. 
they're also not going to have a cooling off period. And that's going to be very characteristic of serial killers. So they're, go they're, not, they're not going to have a time when they're basically recovering from that initial killing or that killing high is decreasing over time. So they're not going to have that. They're literally just going to be one event and done. So oftentimes they're going to be doing this act to send a message to someone. So they're going to have some sort of a they're going to have some sort of a message that they're trying to send through these killings. Okay. And mass murders are going to quantify their success as in increasing the amount of people that they're able to kill. Their goal is to kill as many people as possible. And if they do that, then that will be a job fulfilled. Now, uh, mass murderers oftentimes uh, they go into their events with the idea that they will not be leaving, that they will either kill themselves or be killed by law enforcement as a result of their actions. So some examples of uh, some mass murderers, which I wouldn't say you need to jot these parts down and just kind of give us a little bit of context for uh, these individuals. So uh, the first would be Charles Whitman. So Charles Whitman in 1966 was in the top of a bell tower at the University of Campus, or sorry, the University of Texas. Um, so he killed 14 people uh, with a long rifle, uh, and over the span of about 90 minutes, uh, was terrorizing this campus. So another example would be uh, more recent, looking at the uh, Aurora movie theater shooting. Uh, so this individual killed 12 people and uh, injured 58 in Aurora here in Colorado. And that episode lasted about seven minutes. So as we can see, these uh, the period at which these people are killing is very short. So over the course of minutes or a couple hours. So very, very short time frame there. Okay. So a spree murder is going to be more similar to a serial killer. Uh, than a mass murderer, but they're going to have some key differences. So they're going to kill uh, more than one person at two or more locations. So they're going to be spread out over a large uh, area. Okay. <clears throat> they're typically going to happen very quickly in succession, their kills. Uh, they're not going to have that characteristic cooling off period that a serial killer would have. So they're going to be constantly moving around. <clears throat> hiding, running, and planning to new areas for them to get their next kills. So again, very similar to mass murders, they will often end in suicide as well. So uh, one example of this would be uh, Andrew Cunanan, which uh, if you watch, there was a, a Netflix series uh, about the murder of Johnny Versace, uh, who uh, was on Andrew Cunanan. It was actually a really well done uh, documentary, but he operated in 1997 and he killed uh, five men across four states in Minnesota, Illinois, New Jersey, and Florida. So very spread out. Uh, and the time at which uh, this took place was over the course of about three months. So it's a relatively short period of time. <clears throat> then we also have uh, the murder duo of Charles Starkweather and uh, Carol Fugit. So they murdered 11 people over the course of six weeks. So they clearly didn't have a cool down period as we would with serial killers. So as we mentioned, serial killers are going to be our main focus here. So the definition of a serial killer is someone who kills three or more people over the course of a period of more than one month. If it's shorter than a month, that's going to be uh, a spree killer. Okay, so they're going to have a cooling off period where that killing high is going to uh, basically wear off. So that person, the serial killers, as we'll talk about here shortly, is looking for some sort of gratification. So <clears throat> that gratification and that excitement that they feel is going to last for a relatively long period of time. But once that gratification has worn out over the course of a couple months, then they go out and they seek another victim to uh, satiate that gratification. Okay, so 
So oftentimes there's going to be some sort of need that they have that isn't being met in their normal life, some psychological need. And oftentimes this is going to be something that they developed as a child, as we'll talk about here shortly. Um, so there's going to be some sort of gratification that they receive from killing. And that's going to basically excite them and uh, get, fill their uh, emotional needs uh, in, the, in a period of time here. Sorry, I was clicking on the wrong device there. Um, <clears throat> so they're oftentimes not going to display a clearly defined or rational motive. So to them, their motivations are going to be crystal clear. They know why they're doing it. They're doing it to uh, get this sort of uh, release and get this excitement that they feel. But it's not going to be a rational one. Okay, so we could look at some clear examples of <clears throat> uh, serial killers here. So some of these we can, uh, our names I'm sure you, that most of you guys have heard of. So people like Charles Manson, Ted Bundy, the BTK killer, okay, uh, Jeffrey Dahmer. So looking at individuals like this, we can look at the similarities that they share in order to create what we call a profile or serial killer profile. So a couple things to mention uh, when we talk about uh, creating these, these profiles. So first off, what exactly is a profile? A profile is a tool that's used to potentially identify serial killers that are active or before they've become active. So they allow us to be able to identify some of the similar characteristics that these individuals share. So we're trying to catch individuals and we look at these commonalities of serial killers that we've seen over the past. Okay, I keep clicking my wrong device up here. Okay, all right. So we do, in order, in order for us to create an effective criminal profile, we do need to make some assumptions. Now, we should also say that criminal profiling is not 100% accurate. It's a tool that we use to help decrease our field of suspects as best as we can, but there are individuals who go against these profiles or they might follow some of the parts of a profile and some they do not. So it's not a foolproof system, but it does help us narrow our field of suspects. Okay. So typically any uh, profile is going to be looking at the perpetrator's personality. How is it that they're doing their killings? How, what is the manner in which they're killing their individuals? Now, a big characteristic that really should be our central focus here today is looking at the difference between organized and disorganized serial killers. That's one of the clear, <clears throat> excuse me, the clear categories that we can use to help identify someone by looking at the crime scene that they left behind. Okay. So another key uh, piece of criminal profiling is that because a serial killer is looking for a specific action, a specific thing that's going to give them that gratification, they're going to have a very predictable uh, set of rules that they're going to follow when they're committing their, their murders. So this is what we call modus operandi. So modus operandi is basically how someone commits a crime. It's the signature that's left behind uh, in the way that the crime was committed. So that's going to be unique to a specific serial killer. Now, if we have copycats, so that's someone who's trying to uh, recreate the original killings of a previous serial killer, oftentimes they will have their own take or their own variation of how the killings took place. Okay. But the overall idea here is that the signature will not change for one specific serial killer. The way that the crimes are committed are deeply entwined with that gratification so that the way that the, that the murder is committed is not going to change. Their signature will remain the same. Okay, so there might be something that's left behind at the crime scene. Again, the way that the murder was committed, terminology that the individual uses. So all of that connects into that broader narrative that that person's trying to fulfill. So, and also that over time, the core personality of these individuals, of these serial killers, is not going to change. So, although, as we'll talk about here shortly, uh, organized serial killers 
they can put on a uh, a pretty good show, a pretty good front of them not being a serial killer. They can compose themselves as a normal individual, but their core personality, that fundamental part of their psyche that causes them to need this gratification is not going to change. Okay. So this is definitely the part where I would, and, and this is where we're going to spend the meat of our time here, this class period, is talking about the differences between organized and disorganized serial killers. So we can use these characteristics to help us predict and identify when someone is a serial killer and when someone will become a serial killer. So an organized offender, an organized serial killer is going to have high levels of intelligence. They're going to have a high IQ. They're going to be very, very smart. So they're going to be able to uh, manage a lot in their lives. They're going to have social skills. So they're most likely going to be able to hold up a normal conversation with an individual. A lot of times uh, they'll be able to maintain relationships and friendships with people and they, those individuals won't even know that that person is killing people uh, on, in their second life, per se. So oftentimes they're going to be able to uh, perform sexually. They won't have any, uh, anything preventing them from uh, normal sexual function. So that would be an organized serial killer. So as I mentioned, oftentimes they will have relationships, friendships, and sometimes even spouses. They might have a husband or a wife and kids. And that oftentimes helps feed into the reason why they're so effective at uh, continuing being a serial killer is because they have this, this home life that helps support them as not possibly being able to do these crimes. So oftentimes you can have a spouse or children that are living in the same home as a serial killer and not even know it. Okay. So typically when we say they're going to have a high birth order status, meaning they're going to be an only child or they're going to be uh, one of the eldest siblings in, in a household as they were growing up. So typically uh, organized serial killers, uh, their home life was going to be relatively stable financially. So their father or parents were able to hold a pretty steady job. Uh, they didn't have that added stress of not knowing when the next paycheck was going to come in or uh, basically not having that consistency in uh, financial support. Okay. So also um, we could have, if we think about the discipline of them as a child, an organized serial killer is going to have very inconsistent discipline. So sometimes their discipline is going to be very se severe physical abuse and sometimes it's going to be not very, uh, not very uh, detrimental uh, discipline. So it'll be very inconsistent. It'll be all over the place. And that inconsistency is something that will also lead into the stress and anxiety of that uh, individual uh, as a developing young adult. <clears throat> so oftentimes with an organized uh, serial killer, Basically, if they have some sort of a trigger, a situational stressor, that's going to cause them to start to kill. That's going to cause them to need that gratification to satisfy whatever that stress is inducing inside of them. So they're going to have some sort of a, a stress that's going to cause them to need to kill them, need to kill their victims. So, um, so when, as we mentioned, organized serial killers, they can have very high levels of social skills. So they might appear to be even charming or manipulative, manipulative, um, and they can get people to do what they want them to do. So um, a, the great example of that is Ted Bundy here, which we'll see here in just a moment. Um, a lot of people thought that he was just a regular average guy. And um, a lot of people uh, found him to just be a, a normal person who some people found him physically attractive and charming. And uh, he was very intelligent. He was able to, uh, actually, he passed the bar exam. He was able to be a lawyer. Um, and so he was very high functioning, but he was killing people by night. So uh, another couple characteristics of organized serial killers is that they're typically going to be very mobile. They're going to have some sort of means of transportation. They're going to have their own car, uh, their own uh maybe a, a bus pass or some consistent means of getting around 
their area where they like to hunt. Okay. <clears throat> so oftentimes uh, organized serial killers will pay very close attention to the coverage of their crimes in the media. Oftentimes they'll try to insert themselves into the investigation to help uh, look for potential victims or to provide tips to police officers or phone, phone lines. So uh, they'll try and insert themselves to relive parts of the experience that they had in killing that individual. So as we mentioned, uh, Ted Bundy is a uh, one of the main examples of an organized serial killer. Okay. So that takes us into uh, what a disorganized serial killer is. So a disorganized serial killer is going to be, as you could probably imagine, is going to be the flip side of an organized serial killer. So typically they're going to be below average intelligence. They're not um, going to have a very high IQ level. They're not going to have very... Uh, good social skills. They're not going to be able to hold up conversations with individuals. They're not going to be able to maintain relationships and friendships. Uh, so oftentimes they're going to be not, not be able to perform sexually. And that adds to uh, the stress and frustration that they uh, internalize and they need that gratification for that release. Um, oftentimes they're not going to be very working in very high level jobs. They're going to be working in uh, very unskilled, oftentimes labor intensive positions. Um, so they're not going to be able to have that high level of intelligence and social skills to be able to maintain a, a higher level job. Um, so typically they're going to be uh, younger siblings. So they're going to be not the eldest or only children. They're going to be the youngest of oftentimes very large households. Okay. <clears throat> and also, as we mentioned, um, their, fa their father or their parents will have unstable uh, jobs. So they won't have that consistent financial security that uh, gives them that extra stability at home as they were uh, developing. Okay. So whereas for organized serial killers where their uh, discipline was inconsistent, disorganized serial killers typically experienced consistent, harsh, physical uh, mental and oftentimes sexual abuse as a child. So whereas uh, it's very inconsistent for organized serial killers, it's just consistently bad for disorganized serial killers when they're uh, growing up. Sorry, I keep clicking the, I got too many devices going on up here. <clears throat> so um, because they have this added stress and anxiety of um, just frantically going into an environment uh, oftentimes they're going to be very anxious. They're going to have, they're not going to be very comfortable in the action of killing someone, of breaking into their home or abducting them on a street. And they're going to be very anxious. They're going to have a very stress uh, inducing environment when they are committing that crime. But they're also not going to have a stressor that sets them off and causes them to need that gratification. They're just going to consistently need that gratification. Um, so once that period has ended and their uh, uh, their cooling off period has ended, they'll go out and kill again. Okay. So as we mentioned, they're not going to be able to hold up uh, steady relationships with people. So they're not going to be able to have spouses. They're not going to be able to uh, live with anyone in a meaningful way. So they're uh, typically going to be living alone. They're not going to be uh, dating. They can't have... Uh, high personal hygiene, so they'll most likely won't take very good uh, care of themselves. Um, they won't uh, be interested in their uh, crimes in the media. They won't try and insert themselves into any investigations. And oftentimes they'll function at night because they're not being very organized and uh, very thoughtful in their planning of their kills. They're oftentimes going to need the uh, the cover of night in order to help them facilitate their, their crimes there. Okay. And oftentimes after they commit their crime, there'll be significant behavioral changes that they'll experience. So someone living close to this individual might notice that clear change in their behavior. So a, a big example of this is uh, Ricky or Richard Ramirez. He was also known as the night stalker. So he uh, broke into people's homes at nights and he would quickly kill them and then escape. All right. 
So how can we tell when a serial killer is going to be organized versus disorganized? Well, we look at their crime scene. So we look at the situation or the conditional evidence that they left behind at the crime scene. So organized serial killers, as you could probably guess, are going to be much more planned out. They're going to have a much tighter grasp on what's happening, and they're going to oftentimes target a specific victim. So there's going to be one person that they have a deep personal investment in. So for whatever reason, this person fulfills their fantasy or their gratification that they need. And they're oftentimes going to follow them for a long period of time. They're going to figure out a lot of things about their uh, friends and family. Where do they work? So they're going to take a deep personalization into their victim. So oftentimes they will have some sort of a conversation with their victim. They'll have something that feeds into their narrative that they need in order for them to receive their gratification. So it's going to be a very controlled environment that they are going to exhibit at a crime scene. They're going to not be very uh, chaotic. They're not going to move around a lot. They're not going to most likely have much of a confrontation uh, with the victim. They're most likely going to just have them under their control very quickly. Okay. And they make them submissive, their victims submissive. So uh, they need to be in complete control over their victims in order to feel uh, that, that gratification. So oftentimes to do that, they will restrain their, their victims while they are uh, uh, killing them. So that way they can't fight back. And they also can, again, further that sense of control. Okay. <clears throat> so um, the, Physically aggressive acts that they're going to uh, uh, push on their victims are going to be, again, a measure of that control. So oftentimes they're going to move that body from where the initial kill happened in order to fit into whatever their their fantasy is or their, narr their narrative is going to be in order for them to fulfill that uh, gratification. Okay, And oftentimes they're going to uh, take the weapon from the crime scene. And they will not leave much evidence behind. So they're going to be very good at covering their tracks and cleaning up after themselves after the uh, murder has actually taken place. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So again, kind of the flip side, as you could probably imagine with disorganized serial killers, disorganized serial killers are going to have, sorry, Disorganized serial killers are going to be very spontaneous. They're not going to have a specific plan about when and where they're going to kill someone. They might be walking around one night and pick a house at random or find someone on the street. So they're very spontaneous. They're not going to be planning out. So they, don't, they won't know their victims. And oftentimes they won't be uh, really trying to plan out and personalize and understand who that victim is as a piece of their action here, of their event. So they're not going to have very extensive conversations. Oftentimes, uh, disorganized serial killers are going to uh, kill very quickly. They're not going to sit there and draw it out. They're going to want to get that gratification and then get out. So oftentimes, they'll leave the crime scene very chaotic. They won't. There will be oftentimes a sign of a struggle. They, Because of their lack of planning, they won't be able to really clean up much after their crime scene. So there won't be, uh, there will be a lot of uh, evidence left behind. So as we mentioned, it'll be very quick. So it's very fast. Go in, break into a house, find someone on the street, kill them, and then get out as quickly as possible. Okay. And because of this, they won't use, they won't take the time to restrain uh, the individual. So they will uh, just move, uh, just as we said, move very quickly through uh, the killing. Um, so oftentimes disorganized serial killers, more than organized serial killers, uh, will engage in um, necrophilia. So basically uh, having sex with the body after they've been killed. Um, so that's mostly consistent with disorganized. They won't move the body because, again, they want to get out of there as quickly as possible. The weapon will be left behind and there will be a lot of physical evidence. So again, disorganized is going to not be essentially trying to cover their tracks. They're out in the open saying, this is what I'm doing. I don't really care about cleaning up after myself. Um, so those are some of the key differences between organized and disorganized serial killers. So basically we can look at a crime scene and look if there were restraints used on the victim, 
Is it a chaotic crime scene? Um, was there breaking and entering? Um, was there a weapon that was left behind? Was there a lot of physical evidence? And if there was, we can assume that it was a disorganized serial killer. And conversely, we can look at if there was not really much signs of a struggle, if there were restraints used, things like that to figure out if they were organized. Okay. All right, so within organized and disorganized, there are subgroups of serial killers as well. So we have the visionary. So a visionary is someone who has been driven by some higher power to commit these crimes, whether it's God or demons speaking to them. Um, they've been driven by some outward means that's telling them to kill these people. So that's going to be someone like Son of Sam, for example. Um, so... Uh, they, they see things and oftentimes they're going to be what we call psychotic and psychopathic. So psychotic means that they're losing their grip on reality and psychopathic means that you don't have that empathy for, for someone else. Okay. So we also have the missionary. So this individual is going to be someone who is on a mission. They have a specific goal, oftentimes to eradicate a specific group of people, a specific type of person. Um, and oftentimes these people will not be psychotic. They won't be losing their grip on reality. They just need to fulfill that uh, gratification need. Okay. So then we have hedonistic. So hedonistic means that they're basically just thriving off of the excitement and the thrill of killing someone. So they literally just want that excitement again. And that is their uh, gratification. They seek that, that pleasure there. Okay. So we also have uh, a power or control serial killer. So basically they're looking to control <clears throat> their victim entirely. They want to have complete submissive control over their victims. So the sheer dominance and having the power over life and death of that victim is what excites them. That's what fulfills their gratification. Okay. So these are again, those uh, subgroups. So if we kind of zoom out for a moment and kind of look at some of the general characteristics of uh, serial killers, most of them, at least in the United States are going to be white males. So they're going to be typically aged 25 to 35. And as we said before with, you know, the relationship between disorganized and organized, they can have varying intelligence. Disorganized is going to be very low intelligence. Uh, organized is going to be very high intelligence. And they can be from all walks of life. So they can have a dead-end job and not be able to maintain many social relationships. Or they can be very highly functioning. They can have friendships, uh, marriages, even kids and still be committing these murders. But overall, they're always going to be killing for sex, power, manipulation, or domination and control of their victims. Okay. So a couple other uh, kind of broad characteristics is that usually serial killers are going to kill within their same ethnic group. So <clears throat> they won't cross that ethnic group line and kill uh, other individuals who are not in their same ethnic group. Uh, typically, the age of the victims are going to uh, vary dramatically. Typically, that's because the characteristics that this that the serial killer are looking for are not necessarily tied to age. So it might be for Ted Bundy, it was a uh, specific hairstyle uh, in his female victims. They needed to have hair that matched uh, one of his uh, college girlfriends. So there might not necessarily be much consistency in the age of those victims. But usually, there's not going to be any prior contact from the serial killer to the victim. So there's not going to be some expressed animosity towards the victim. Um, they typically won't know them until they've targeted them. Okay, But usually, there's going to be some sort of symbolism in choosing that specific victim. And oftentimes, that's to fulfill uh, their fantasy. Okay? <clears throat> so... Uh, a couple of other key characteristics of uh, serial killers is that they're usually going to be uh, sociopaths or psychopaths, meaning that they don't properly empathize with other individuals. So this might lead them to be narcissistic, to think overly highly of themselves. Um, they might be very self-centered. 
but most of them are going to be very manipulative, especially the organized individuals. So organized serial killers are usually going to be very manipulative. They're going to be able to control people and get them to do what they want to do, but they're not going to experience much emotion for other people. Some other people, they're just, uh, their victims are just vessels for them to fulfill their gratification. Okay. So you've heard me talk about this idea of fantasy a lot today. So all humans naturally fantasize about what we dream, what we aspire to be, what we want to happen in life. But serial killers, as we'll talk about shortly, um, create this fantasy that they start to develop as a child that is rooted oftentimes in uh, violence and sexual fantasy. So oftentimes there's going to be a very specific victim that they're going to be looking for to fulfill that fantasy. And they're going to need to continue uh, to do the exact same set of, set of steps in order to fulfill that fantasy. So again, this is going to show us what the MO or the modus operandi is of that individual. And that's central in being able to develop a profile to try and find someone who is a serial killer. It's figuring out what drives them. What is their overall goal? What do they want out of this killing? What is their fantasy that they're trying to imagine? So a couple other pieces here. Okay. And I appreciate your guys' patience. I know we've been going for a while. Uh, we are in the home stretch here though. Okay. So uh, looking at uh, a typical criminal. So someone who's uh, following a crime set that's going to be, a my, I just combined crime, criminal and mindset, a mindset in a crime who is going to be more logical would be if you're taking something from a crime scene, it's most likely going to have some sort of value, right? You're going to be uh, taking money, jewelry, electronics, things that you're going to be able to get wealth from. Or you're going to be taking away a murder weapon or something that might help you uh, not get caught. You might remove that from the crime scene. But a serial killer oftentimes is going to take things from the crime scene that don't have any inherent value. Oftentimes it's going to have a value to the serial killer, but it's not going to have value out in society. So they use these objects that they take from the crime scene to relive the crime. So later on, as that killing high starts to decrease, they go back to that trophy or that souvenir and relive some of that experience and help boost that, uh, um, help boost that kind of uh, cooling off period over time. Okay. <clears throat> so um, lastly here, the last big piece I wanted to talk about, uh, as we, you've heard me kind of mention a couple times as well, is that a lot of these traits and these attributes develop as the serial killer is developing as a child. So oftentimes it's going to arise from some sort of physical, psychological, or sexual abuse that happened when that uh, individual was prepubescent, so approximately before age 13 and after. So basically the as a child, they're creating a fantasy world to try and escape that physical abuse. So they're using the fantasy that they're creating to protect themselves from that physical, mental, and emotional abuse. So what happens is over time, as they continue to escape to this fantasy world, it starts to blend together with their real world and their sexual fantasies also get tied up in that. So eventually it gets to a point where those two fantasies are no longer separable and they're want the serial killers just need to fulfill whatever that fantasy is. So for example, for Ted Bundy, as I mentioned before, uh, he was looking for a specific type of victim that had the exact same hair as his college sweetheart at the time. So <clears throat> the last little kind of idea I want to leave you guys with is the question of whether or not serial killers are made or are they born? So this whole idea of nature versus nurture. So nature being that inherently in that individual's brain chemistry, they were always going to be a serial killer, no matter what. And the nurture being that their life experiences that they had as a child created who they are as a serial killer. So 
oftentimes we find that it's a combination of both, but there are specific genetic markers that predispose someone to being a serial killer. So uh, I'm not going to play it here or anything like that, but if you want to explore this, uh, this hyperlink here, uh, there's actually a really good, sh very short TED ed um, by a, a neurologist by the name of Jim Fallon, who basically identified some key genes that were involved in many uh, serial killers that he uh, was researching. So that's kind of just an interesting little, little watch there, just a supplementary piece. <laughs> 